this is a uh, this is a lot of fun. This is something. So Carter's been with our team since uh, since mid summer and um, since his first day on the team. He was like, "We got to get you out to do some skeet shoots." So I'm really excited to be here and and uh, spend some time with y'all this morning. Um, I'm Cameron. Uh, nice to nice to meet y'all. And um, and I'm just really excited. We're 24 days away from this congressional election, and uh, and a lot has happened in the 429 days since I started this campaign. But you know who's counting? Um, we've been able to really make an argument, and that's what this has been all about. It's been about saying what is the defining nature of this congressional district, this district that's huge and sprawling. Who are we as a as a district? And my idea was always that we are a diverse district. There's no one version of the 5th Congressional District. So it was always about making sure that we have a posture, a perspective that says that everybody in this district should have opportunities to succeed. Opportunities for health, opportunities for success. And that's what we've been fighting for every single day. And it's working. It's working because we are meeting everybody where they are, whether it's skeet shooting or playing basketball or having conversations with students and parents or, or talking to leaders and communities all over the district, we've been doing the work. And even when the pandemic hit in March, we kept doing the work. You know, pe people talk about the size of this congressional district. It's huge. It's 10,000 square miles. It's bigger than the state of New Jersey. But we realized we had a unique advantage this year because usually you, you can't get from Fuck here to Danville in one hour. We can do it with the click of a button this year. How do you take a moment like that and use it to your advantage? That's what we're doing. We're meeting people on telephones, we're meeting people in Zoom chat rooms, and then we're coming down and having safe distanced events to meet people too, because if we do all those things every single day, if we win every single day, we will win this race. And why is it so important to win this race? Listen, it's not about Democrats winning or Republicans winning, it's about the people of the 5th Congressional District winning. It's about restoring this idea that everybody here has something. They have somebody who's their advocate, who's fighting for them in Washington, D.C. And ideally, they have somebody who's fighting for them in Richmond, and they have somebody who's fighting for them right there in their local community, and those individuals are all working together. That's what it's going to take for us to actually make things work in communities all across this district. In 21 different counties, in two different cities, that's what it's going to take. So, you know, the background that I have, I'm a doctor and lawyer and professor. I think some of you know that, that background. But what I always tell people is that more than what I do, it's who I am. And despite that shoddy experience shooting that gun, I'm a kid from Spotsylvania County, Virginia. That's who I am at my core. I'm the third of six kids growing up in my family. So I got that middle child thing where I like to listen to the people around me rather than step into rooms assuming that it's all about me. You know, I'm focused on ideas like equity, that everybody should have opportunities to succeed. Not everybody should have the same thing, but everybody should have what they need to be able to succeed. I've heard that from school board members all over this district. That's the idea that we want to invest in. So how do we do that? That idea that it's not just about talk, because we hear so much talk. It's about action. It's about what we can actually get done, what we will fight for. And that's where I'm coming in. That's my perspective on this. And I have no misgivings about how broken our Congress is. Congress is broken. That's not a surprise to anybody standing out here today. And the reason it's broken is because everybody says, my side's going to win, or your side's going to lose, instead of saying, how do we work together to get something done? And I don't want you to hear that and think that I'm naive. That comes from the work that I did in the White House. I worked in the White House in 2016 and 2017. I worked in the Obama White House for five months and in the Trump White House for seven months. Couldn't have been more different between those two experiences. But what I saw working between those two very different administrations was the fact that we have more in common than we have that's different. And I know that's a shocking idea to a lot of people, but it's actually true. On things like health care, we all believe that people should have access to the care that they need. In education, we believe that every student should have a chance to succeed. In our communities, we believe that we should have good paying jobs. We believe that everybody should have access to rural broadband, that that's something that, that we should have in all of our communities because that's key, critical infrastructure in the 21st century. There are so many issues where we are all on the same page. So why can't we get something done? It's because we're more concerned about one side winning and one side losing than the people actually winning. That's the problem. And until every single congressional district in the United States 
pick somebody who's willing to work with people who see things differently than they do, we will continue to lose. We, the people, will continue to lose. And that's why I'm stepping up. That's why I'm standing up here. Again, for me, it's about the people first. It's about the folks who I see from my vantage point as a doctor, folks who I take care of, who I've been taking care of in our communities for years now. It's about making sure that they have those opportunities they need to stay healthy, those opportunities they need to achieve success. It's not going to be easy. It is going to be hard work, but I know a thing or two about hard work. And so with that, I don't want to talk at you too long. I'm happy to take any questions that you have, but I just want to give you really quickly some quick updates on the campaign because we're in the home stretch. So again, 429 days in, where are we right now? Well, this was a race that when I announced my campaign last August, people said there's no chance that a Democrat wins in the 5th Congressional District. No chance. And in fact, they said you could run a perfect race. There's a less than 10% chance that you pull this off. <laughs> and I know we've heard that before. It's been 10 years since the Democrat won. Well, this race was one that we took a, a different approach. We said we're going to run from last August all the way through the final day, November 3rd, as if we're running for the general. Not just focusing on Democrats, focusing on everybody the entire time. And we won that primary with two-thirds of the vote. We won in all 21 counties and in both cities. We galvanized the Democratic Party on the front end. That was important. It's, it's necessary, but not sufficient. The next thing is, this is a race that was a likely Republican seat in May, a leans Republican seat in June. Then Carter showed up, magic happened, and now it's a toss-up race <laughs> right now, right? We've, we've made this race go from a likely Republican seat to a toss-up race. That's the, the leading prognosticators, the folks who are looking at a race and saying, who's going to win? They're saying they can't call it. And I played a lot of basketball growing up, and I like a jump ball. That means whoever wants it more is who gets it. That's where we are right now. That's where we are with 24 days left. And in fact, we've actually inched ahead a little bit. We released the poll yesterday. We're up 3%. That doesn't happen in the 5th Congressional District for a Democrat. It's because folks like you have been just getting the word out. The, the person that you're seeing in front of you, you're like, you know, I, I see a regular guy. I see somebody who's committed to our communities. I see somebody who's passionate about service. I see somebody who's going to do right by us in Washington. That's what people are saying. That's the message that's getting spread. Not just by Democrats, but by independents. And there's a lot of independents in this district. And by even some conservatives. Folks who are moderate conservatives or libertarians, they're saying, you know what? The voice and the values that represent me more, that guy over there. And, and what's happening is we are getting the momentum that's necessary to win this race. Anything could knock us off course. Our national politics loom large because it's so broken, the dynamics between Republicans and Democrats. But that's why we have to keep this race very local. We have to keep people focused on the two candidates in front of them and we have to keep them focused on what it is that we bring to the table. What insight, what expertise, what leadership, what compassion, what approach to our politics we bring to the table. If we do that for 24 more days, we will win this race. On my team, we say it every single day. We say, how do we win today? You say that enough times, you win enough todays, you win a congressional race. It's not just winning a race for the sake of winning a race. It's winning a race so we have an opportunity to make some real change, to represent this district well, again, with compassion, with thoughtfulness, with real leadership. So I, I'm so grateful you came out here this morning to watch me be pretty bad at shooting a gun, and, uh, and grateful that you would just spend the time to get to know more about this campaign in this critical election cycle. It's a very, it's a very big choice for folks in this district. Very different candidates. And I don't speak on my, my opponent, I let him talk for himself. From my perspective, I know what we bring to the table. And if you're paying close attention, you see what he brings to the table. Especially here in Campbell, you have a good sense. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions that you all have about any policy issues or areas, or just about the race in general. I'm happy to take any questions. Yes? The only issue that they are scaring people with trying to attack Defunding police. Right. They're trying to say you're for defunding police. Bob Good defunded the police by cutting the budget here in Campbell County. Right. What is your straight up opinion on defunding the police? I don't think we should defund the police. I, I've said that as many times as can be said. In fact, even the quote that they used, I never even say I support defunding the police. 
So, so what's interesting is they're using that as a wedge, wedge issue simply because their polling tells them that it might scare enough people out of voting for me. We saw a mailer once from, from his campaign that said, vote against Cameron Webb on November 3rd. Not vote for Bob Good. It said vote against Cameron Webb. This is about scaring people away from voting for this campaign. So no, I don't support defunding the police. My dad worked in law enforcement for two decades. You know, I rec As a physician, as a healer, as somebody who's passionate about health and safety, of course I'm passionate about our public safety. I want that public safety to, to extend to all Americans. I think there's a, there's a need for some criminal justice reform, but that doesn't mean taking funding away from police departments that are hard hit. Our, our local law enforcement offices don't have the resources necessary to do the job they need to do. And so when I talk to sheriffs all over this district, and I have, the conversations we have, they're not about defunding the police. They're about how to do more community-oriented policing, how to eliminate the burden of these uh, you know, ECOs, as we call them, emergency custody orders, where yes. they're spending all yes. this time doing mental health work. Right? How do we extend their capacity by allowing them to focus on policing and having the resources for mental health professionals as well? They want to partner in a smart way. How do we make sure there are grants for training? So they can get the training that they need because when budgets are hard hit, like in the coronavirus recession we have right now, state and local budgets hard hit because of tax revenues, the thing that's on the chopping block is these training that they need. So how do we make sure from a federal standpoint we keep that training in place? When I finish those conversations with sheriffs, they say, you sound like a pretty reasonable guy with me. I look forward to working with you if you win this race. That's, that's the reality. And that's the message we'll continue to get out there. We know that truth is stronger than disinformation. And, uh, and we know that we will get that message out there. Thank but a great question. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Mm -hmm. very much. I know one of the concerns I've heard is that if you win as a freshman congressman, you won't be able to stand up to the organization already there. Oh, yeah. And that that's why people are shying away from voting you, voting for you, even though they may not like the alternative. Right. So what is your plan, or how are you going to not get caught up in that? Right. So as you can, it's a, it's a very valid question because, like I said, our our Congress is broken and that political system it, it's it's broken. Um, I remind folks my background, not my goal for what life could look like, but what I've already done. And as somebody who leans to the left, as a Democrat, I worked in the Trump White House for seven months. <laughs> right? How do you survive in a space like that without being able to be an independent thinker? Even in the Obama administration, there were times where I pushed back against that administration for things I didn't think were in the best interest of individuals. It's always important to be able to speak up. And one thing my parents taught me, is I'm, anybody who knows me knows I'm not, I'm not shy about sharing my opinion. And that's what I think we need in our Congress. That's my whole reason for doing this. And so I always say I'm not beholden to any party leader, and I'll work with any party leader. So no matter who they are, no matter where they are. My only boss are the, it's the people of the 5th Congressional District. If I do this wrong, I won't have this job very long, right? And so doing it right looks like on every single issue saying this is what serves the 5th Congressional District well. And, and I think that's going to be the solution. The good thing is I looked at folks like Abigail Spanberger in the 7th Congressional District and how she's approached that as a freshman lawmaker and saying, hey, what does this look like for me to defend my district? And then she's actually my parents' representative. And I think that she's been able to, to move the needle on that a little bit. And I think continue to have that conversation about stepping into that space, not focused on party, focused on people. That's what I aim to do. That's the conversation I've had with party leadership. When they've called me and said, congratulations on winning your primary, I always talk about, well, listen, let me tell you about my district. Let me tell you about what it means to serve my district. Well. So I think the good thing is, um, with me, you've got a strong advocate. In fact, you know, I'll talk briefly about my opponent because... Uh, the thing that he accuses me of in terms of falling in line with Democrats, that's the way he thinks. He's just like, I'm going to do whatever Donald Trump tells me. Even if it were not in the best interest of the people of the 5th District, whatever he tells you, you've got to be an independent thinker. You've got to be willing to do things on your own. That's where Congressman Riggleman actually had it right as a moderate conservative. He was like, I'll work with Democrats on climate change. You have to be able to think like that to be effective for your district. Or, you know, and I think that's where I, I say I can do this much better by saying I'm not beholden to any party or any party leader. I'm beholden to the people of the state. That's my perspective. If I don't deliver on that, fire me. Other thoughts? Two about the topics. Yeah. One, um, the, the hot button issues in the 5th District, one is gun control. Yeah. And I don't see anybody really trying to take away our guns. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Maybe I missed it. Go figure. Yeah. Um, 
but I've watched you, and you want reasonable gun use. Right. You don't want any person with no training whatsoever to have access to a weapon. Right. Um, that's one, and I think I know where you stand, so there's no, no, no answer needed. One is women's, women's rights. Right. And um, I think Bob Good has said that he wants to ban abortions for any reason whatsoever, right. no matter what. Right. And as I look around and I see about half of the people here are women. Right. And he wants to strip them of their rights to control themselves. Now, and you're not, I don't think you're in favor of unlimited abortions. You're in favor of Roe versus Wade. Yeah. With the restrictions well, there. And, and, to, and I appreciate you raising both of these. I'll start with the latter one since you just talked about it. Um, I don't think that any politician should be making a decision so intimate as what a woman should do with their body. I think that that decision is a woman's decision to make. And that's where I stand. So that's why I say I'm pro-choice. I'd never say I'm pro-abortion. It's not that I want everybody to have abortions. It's that I want every woman to have that fundamental right to make decisions with their own body. All right? And that decision is between them, their doctor, and their faith if that's part of the equation for them. That is what's important. It's not for any any man, any legislator, anybody to say, this is what you must do with your body. And as conservatives, that's something they should lean into. They don't want government making decisions on things that intimate, on things that, that determine their, the course of action with their own bodies. That's not right. And so that's where I stand. That's a government overreach, and it shouldn't be the decision of government. Now, on the issue of guns, I, I talk about it a lot from the perspective of being a lawyer and saying I, I understand the Second Amendment, I respect the Second Amendment, I think it's an important part of kind of our history, our legacy, and how we protect ourselves against tyranny. At the same time, as a physician, and my wife's an emergency doctor, you know, she's worked in Chicago, in New York City, in Baltimore, she's seen a lot of gun violence from that standpoint. And because of that, you recognize there's a, there's a public health challenge with gun violence. And I always tell people the biggest threat to, to their guns isn't Democrats. It's people who would do harm to themselves or other people. That's what we need to work on. So we should have common sense strategies that are evidence-based. Things like violent history checks. Right? If you've got a violent history, maybe we shouldn't be allowing you to, to go out and buy unlimited guns. Or, or similarly, uh, making sure that we're, we're doing the research necessary to really understand where our problem areas are with guns. 